the trip, Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with a very popular young adult author, Christina Inquest. Now, Christina is here to share with us her new book, The Amundos, which is her debut novel. So let's welcome to the show, Christina. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. What a pleasure it is to have you here, oh my goodness, yeah, especially with the debut of your new book, how exciting is that? Yes, very exciting. Yeah, I get emails all the time, people going, how did, how did she get started, what's her writing process? So why don't you share with us a little bit about your background and your inspiration, what kind of started you to start writing books? Well, it's actually interesting because... Um, I did want to be a writer since I was young, since I was in elementary school, and there was this competition that we had in sixth grade, and in this competition, the teacher had us create our own book covers, <clears throat> create the own, uh, our own stories, and create the artwork, and so we all, um, all of us in our class with Mr. Graham at Lincoln School in Salinas, um, we all created our books, and they were submitted to competitions. And of course, um, I didn't win at the time, which was devastating, but I still knew that I wanted to be um, a writer in some way. And so in junior high, I took journalism. And in journalism class, I learned some other uh, techniques as far as um, stories and photographs and how to lay out a yearbook. And um, from there, you know, it, the focus was really how can I improve my um, situation also. How can I um, have a better lifestyle um, than what I was in? And so, you know, in looking at writing and looking at other careers, um, I quickly realized that, you know, writing wasn't really something that was going to be bringing in money. So I kind of deterred my path from writing and I started focusing on other things. So when I went to college, I actually went to college and started off as a, interestingly enough, because I just love the arts, um, as a music major, because I also love to sing. And I did drama in high school. <clears throat> but um, it, I realized, again, because I, I keep going towards my passions, but then, of course, my mind kicks in and says, you know, you can't follow your heart, you have to follow your mind and um, what's going to really help you out financially. So I switched from music to business administration, and then from there I went on to get a bachelor's in organizational behavior and a doctorate, um, a master's in education and a doctorate in educational leadership. So going through school um, was quite a lengthy process. I was a single mom. I had my son at 18. I actually graduated from high school. Um, I think I was seven months pregnant. And um, so, you know, I had to figure out, you okay, know, how am I going to, how am I going to work and go to school and raise my son? Fortunately, I wouldn't have been able to do it without family support. So, family was very crucial in in where I am now because I was able to go through school. Now, to get my associate's degree, it actually took me ten years. And to get my bachelor's degree another four years, I did an accelerated master's program, so that was one year, and then four additional years to obtain my doctorate. And then after that, because during that whole process, of course, I'm really busy getting my son into different programs. I got him into acting. He actually performed in some shows with me. Um, and I decided after finishing school, you know, I didn't have homework, I didn't have fun activities. Could be, my son right now is already 26, he's going to be 27 this year. And um, so I'm going to my doctor, what do I do now? <laughs> and I had, <laughs> I had gone to the practice of meditating, uh, doing transcendental meditation. And so after one of my sessions of meditating, I just had this story kind of come to me, and I was working very quickly to try to get it all down, and it took me three months um, after work and on the weekends to get the whole story down. But of course, being my first round of the novel, um, it had to go through three years <laughs> of the editing process, and that included my alpha leader, who's my husband now. I, I, became married, um, I think my son was 15 when I got married, 
So he was already I raised him pretty much um, as a single mom and it wasn't until he was a teenager that I actually got married. But um, my husband's my operator. I've had several operator leaders and then of course um, the amazing priestess of the Gary um, was one of my editors and Katrina Diaz Arnold. And they um, used to work for the traditional publishers and so that was very important to me to get editors for my story who have been in the publishing world and who have worked with New York Times bestsellers and international bestsellers and young adult novels. So that was very crucial. And as far as inspiration goes, I think it really ties into just everything at the time. Um, I was actually living in Santa Clara and working in Santa Clara at Santa Clara University as the director of the Center for Professional Development. And um, at the time I was vegan. And so, you know, to me, animal rights is it's still very important. I'm vegetarian now. Um, I'm back in the Central Valley in Visalia, California. But animal rights is so very important to me. And so I think um, part of what came about was not really focusing a story on animal rights, but just people in general and the way that people are treated and, and you know, how far can science go? How far should we allow science to go? So just a lot of different things that I was kind of um, battling with internally as far as uh, this world and look where we're at and <laughs> look what we're doing um, kind of came through in the story, I think. Uh, it, it really did. And, and this, it was interesting is, I mean, this is a young adult book, but it's really for everybody. Because the message, and we'll get to this in a little bit, but the overall message for the book, if you step back and you look at the just the bigger picture the book is relaying, it's really a message that's for any age. Oh yeah, I I totally agree. Well, and so then, and I get, uh huh, go ahead. Oh, I totally have readers um, that are children to adults to teenagers. Uh, and it's nice because I've received messages on my website um, from individuals. One person in particular had mentioned how she purchased the book for herself and for her twin 13-year-olds, and they all loved it and read it over the weekend. <laughs> so it's always exciting to get the fan now. Yeah, that feedback. Well, I mean, and I think it's so important, especially when we look at a book that is kind of talking about some of the bigger picture, you know, like what we're doing to the environment, how we're treating animals. And, you know, it kind of, it, you know, gives room for a pause. So when you were developing the storyline, did you know that that was the direction you really wanted to go in? Or was it something that just kind of morphed and developed on its own as you began writing? It morphed and developed on its own, really, because um, as I was writing, and I, to this day, I don't have writer's block, and I really think it's because of the fact that, you know, I work during the day, and so it's like the, the stories build up, and so by the time I sit down at the keyboard, it just flows out. So when I was writing this particular story, uh, it just kind of flowed out, and I just let it take its form. Um, and it wasn't until the editing process that I started um, doing shifts. So, for example, I started out with a love triangle, and the wisdom, with the wisdom of my editors, <laughs> I changed that because apparently that was overdone. And so I changed it from the love triangle um, to just focusing on one relationship. Yeah, and doing it that way. Well, it's easy to see what a testament your life is, and I'm so glad that you took the time to share that with us today. You know, just your journey as a writer and following your passion and where you've, you've come, because I think for a lot of young girls, especially when we look at different places across the U.S., the Central Valley in California is, is probably one where people feel like they kind of get stuck in positions where, you know, that maybe they feel that there are no options, and you're showing women how to, especially young girls, how to blaze their own trail. Definitely. I hope I, I, hope I am an inspiration for others because, you know, I always tell, because I also teach part-time at College of the Sequoias, and I always tell my students um, in the student success class that when it comes to uh, challenges or things that are happening in life, they don't necessarily, um, it's important for them to not view them as obstacles, but for opportunities for them to grow and find out what exactly can they learn from that experience that will make them a better person. Um, 
and be able to accomplish all the things that they want to accomplish because really nothing in life should stop them from doing anything that they believe in or they feel passionate about. Yeah, because you just really never know. I mean, it's interesting when you hear like different ballet dancers that you know they kind of go through the, the same type of thing where they're thinking, gosh, you know, this is going to be a hard thing to make a career out of. I better look at plan B. You know, and, and then you just never know who's going to be that prima ballerina or who's that next rising star. Yeah. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't go into the story too much of the Amundas because I don't want to give it away. But um, from an author's standpoint, what would you like to share about the book? The Amundas is about Mia. She's a 16-year-old geneticist, apprentice. Um, the world that I created, it's in the year 2028. And it's basically looking at um, what's happened as a result of global climate change and how the world's changed, how the, you know, the, I have the polar ice caps have officially melted. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it's changed the landscape of the country, um, how genetically modified organisms are seeds and people that are against it and people that are for it, how it kind of shifted um, the landscape and how these peerless groups kind of came together and formed their own colony, so to speak, and they're called um, genuses. And so their country is the domus. And these genuses are surrounded by walls, and it protects the purest lands because they don't want any of the genetically modified seeds to infiltrate their uh, communities. But they're very big communities. Um, and so in this world, you know, fashion, trends, they come and they go. So I decided, you know, what is the future going to look like? What's clothing? What things are we going to be using? Um, so I decided, you know, let's do some retro. Why not? <laughs> There's things now that we have that existed back in the day. Um, my sister's really into um, retro clothing and, and retro styles and so I thought, why not, you know, have people in the future be retro and like music from today and like mm -hmm. um, movies and, and clothing. So I have um, the main character and her friends um, are kind of the retro folks who like the old stuff. They like what we have today. But there's also technology, of course, that I display that it definitely exists in the future. Um, and it's amazing because when I first wrote the book, um, the three-month period of time when I wrote the book, there's things that happened in the book that I'm starting to see happen now. So it's kind of uh, freaky <laughs> in that way. <laughs> that you're making up in your mind and then all of a sudden, what, they're doing this in another country? Um, and the microchips are, are, are an example of that because in the book I have microchips in my hands that they can put it to readers and it opens doors. And then I saw a video all of a sudden that apparently another company in another country is, is using that technology. So it's, it's interesting to see that. Um, but the Amundus is really um, looking at, you know, everything that we see now, everything that we see in the news or that I saw, you know, a couple of years ago when I first wrote it. And um, what do I perceive or speculate will the world will look like in 2028. So that's my vision of the world in 2028 based on um, what I saw a couple of years back. Hmm. Well, it's interesting if you look at some of the, I can think they call these cult classics, so like the Back to the Future series. I mean, they have a lot of stuff in there that, you know, you look at, you know, glasses where you can read, the, you know, kind of read what's going on in the news and and these different things, so you know, we've got Google Glasses and Hubble Globes now and different things like that. So, you know, it is, uh, it's interesting how the, the imagination can really bring forth to life these different inventions and these different processes. Yeah, definitely. And if somebody well, actually, I'm sorry, I was at a book mm -hmm. festival, and somebody actually came up to my booth and asked me about my book, and I said, what, well, science fiction? 
And he said, oh no, I don't read science fiction. I'm like, well, why? And he was like, because everything that you guys write about comes true. (laughs) 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 Well, then you should really pay attention to this book then, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, and so where do you see um, your writing taking from here? Are you uh, in the works of another book? What, What are your thoughts on all of that? Oh my gosh, I have several books and I really can't keep up with everything that I um, need to write, but I do notice, of course, I have book two, it's a trilogy, um, mm-hmm. and then I also have Macy and the Magi is actually further along than the Mundus book two, and that's a middle grade fantasy. Um, so I'm very excited about Macy and the Magi. And then I do have another book, it's a new adult book. And that is kind of a, a remake of Merlin. It's looking at Merlin from a completely different perspective. And then um, I decided to do some screenwriting, some playwriting. So I actually wrote a short film script, and it's going to be filmed this summer. I already have the chemical crew and the actors and actresses. And so I'm excited about that. And I decided, why to stop there? I, I need to write a full full um, play, uh, not a play, a, a screen. It's a play. The length movie. Yeah. So, yeah, and so I decided to write it about, you know, I loved um, the Joy Luck Club and mm-hmm. how it looked at today and they're reflecting back on uh, the Asian culture and the different individuals and their life and the, their life in the past. And so I decided, well, why not I do that with my grandparents. Um, I think my grandmothers in particular have um, some very interesting stories. And so, of course, it won't be exactly like their life. I'm going to, um, it's inspired by their lives, mm-hmm. but I'm going to embellish it to make it an interesting story. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that, that's exciting because I've already asked family members some questions. I already have some information when I, they both passed. Um, but I have already acquired information from them before they passed about their, their lives. So I'm, I'm excited about you know, using their stories to kind of build something uh, phenomenal, I hope. <laughs> and I'm Hispanic, so it'll be the joy of that demo, but in the Hispanic way. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, and you know, everyone has amazing stories, and it's so. I'm, I'm sure when in your family, you know, it's kind of honoring your heritage and your family, being able to look at this and put it in a different perspective. And I think a lot of people will be able to relate to that, including because it's, it's that kind of hits again, like both markets. Even though it's kind of some of it's young adult, but a lot of it's adult. You know? Yeah. Very interesting. Well, and so was there a point where you decided, hey, I, you know, when you look at the, both the young adult and the adult categories for writing, was there a point where you said, well, I really want to focus on the young adult, and, and was there a specific reason why? Um, no, I'm not really trying to focus on the young adult. It just happened that way. Um, and same with my middle grade and new adult novel. You know, as the stories come, if the main characters happen to be um, young or or an adult, then I'll, I'll write it. <laughs> so I'm not focusing mm-hmm. on any specific age group. And and like we mentioned earlier, the members, even though the main characters are um, teenagers, I think it really speaks to adults as well. And even younger kids. I thought that it did. I, I thought that was very well written. And it relates to people of all ages. I didn't feel like it, when I was picking it up. And sometimes you pick up young adult books and you're like, oh, this is really for young adults. But your book was not that way. It, it, it very much felt like anyone could pick it up and relate to it. That's, that's very good. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you share with us, because I know I get lots of people writing in, why don't you share with us what your... Um, writing process is like, because gosh, with such a busy schedule, I mean, you've got so many irons in the fire, the work you do, family, all of that. How did you find time to write? Well, at the time that I wrote The Amandus, um, it was interesting because my husband was in Visalia, 
and I was actually living in Santa Clara. I had finished my doctorate program and um, decided that I I needed to move into um, an educational arena, so university or a community college. But as you know, I just wasn't getting any bites in the Central Valley, so I started branching out, and I ended up getting a job in Santa Clara. But of course, my home and my husband and my son and everybody else was here in Visalia, California. And so I took the job and um, quickly moved over. We ended up renting an apartment over there. Plus, we had a home in Visalia, so Kevin stayed here because he worked in Visalia. And while I lived on the, during the weekdays in Santa Clara, and so Friday after work, I would drive back to Visalia, stay with um, my husband, and then early Monday morning, I would head off back to um, Santa Clara. So I really had all that time alone <laughs> to focus on writing. And but after a year of, of paying for that apartment, we were like, forget it, it's just too much money. Yeah. So I started renting a room. Um, so part of the writing process happened, or the editing process happened um, in somebody else's home that I was renting a room from. But the majority of the story was created in the apartment in Santa Clara. Um, and then when I came over here, you know, I had to come in, when I came back and got a job here at the hospital, I decided that, okay, how am I going to do this now that I have my husband here and um, I thought I still need to make time to write. But what's really great is he is so understanding and supportive of me writing and so he's okay. Like, I'm sitting at the keyboard. I'm like, are you okay? Do you want me to get up? Do you want me to stop and sit with you? He's like, no, you do your thing. <laughs> so <laughs> I've been fortunate to have a husband who's, who allows me to have my creative time after work. Um, but I have to admit, I do get burnt out. So sometimes it's like I'll spend a week just vegging, <laughs> sitting in front of the TV. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, I'm energized again. I can go back to the keyboard um, after work. But yeah, I do have those moments where I just have to kind of not have to have brain work, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. And have that downtime because, I mean, my goodness, just the drive from Santa Clara to Visalia and back and forth, that's like three, over three hours, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> Think of that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's quite crazy. a commute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it really is quite a commute, but I mean, I, I know there are people with less busy schedules that are trying to find time to write, and so your story really tells them, hey, you know, there's no excuse, just get to writing. Yes, this is very true. We, it's so important to, when it comes to time management, um, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert at it by any means, um, but I think it is important to kind of sit down and decide, you know, what are your values and what's important to you, um, because then that helps you to determine, you know, what are you going to put your power, your energy into that kind of meshes with those values. Mm -hmm. that at all. Well, and so, in, um, was there a part when you were going through your writing process that you were like, you know, I really need to switch this around to make this more prominent or, you know, or, um, maybe something about the earth more prominent? Um, was this ever a point where you made some really drastic changes after the first few edits? Um, really drastic changes, huh? Some authors do, and that's why it's so good. <laughs> and sometimes they write it out, and then they look at it. But you know, when when you have a character doing something, and then they they you know totally change. Kind of like how you were talking initially. There was the love triangle. Like, oh, that's, that's been overworked. So you kind of switch that out. Yeah, I definitely took the guidance of the editors to make any changes. But I I wouldn't say that I made any. Uh, major changes to the story because I wanted to make the changes. If there were any changes that were made, it's um, based on the guidance from the editors who, who I trusted and who I still trust and definitely plan on working with them in the future. Um, but there is, um, you know, there's more of the world that I created that was actually the end of book one. And so one of the things that... Um, I wanted to kind of share in book one was the fact that, you know, the pipe, the oil pipelines, how 
now in the future, um, they pretty much all devolved and burst, and so now there's these rivers of oil that kind of run across the nation um, outside of the genuses, and that was part of the ending initially for Book One, where they're kind of traversing the land outside of the genuses, and and um, they start to experience what the world outside of the genus looks like. But um, based on the guidance from that, we just already went ahead and ended it where it's currently ended. And so we don't get to see that part of the world where they're kind of navigating through um, the outside world. And, but that is definitely going to be part of the two. At the beginning of the two was the ending of the one. So you get to see Mia travel um, outside of the genus and and discover what the world looks like now in 2028. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and it can be it can be a whole lot of look a whole lot of different ways. And I really love how you touched on the genetic modifying piece in, in relationship to foods because the thing is is like you know we're using something that we're not 100 percent sure what the side effects will be. You know that there's not been a whole lot of uh, testing on that. I mean, if animals aren't eating it, that to me is problematic. You know, so you look at these things and going, where does this put, um, how does this affect the human population, you know, in the future? And I think you address some of that question as, as a, you know, and raise the concern in the book where, you, you know, we're taking a really staunch look at that. Yeah, and if you look throughout history, um, scientists and, and the general public, if things is at at the time, it's always okay. <laughs> but then later on in the future, you start discovering things are bad. Um, tobacco, you know, smoking, um, asbestos <laughs> was in homes. Coke that used to have a drug in it, um, just all these sorts of things that, you know, oh yeah, it's okay, let's put it out there to the general public, let them, let them have it, it's really enjoyable, oh yeah, it's great to build a home, let's use this, but then afterwards we start saying, okay, wait, are we lab rats? <laughs> at least, you know, that's when I look back and look at those different things, I'm like, well, are we lab rats that are actually um, being tested on as far as they're just throwing things out into the public and if it's great, great. If something bad happens, then oh, we'll deal with it then. <laughs> so that's why I thought, well, this stuff has happened in the past. Why couldn't it happen in the future where now they're reflecting back and seeing all the things that they did that were supposedly okay, but now in the future, um, as science progresses, they start realizing where they screwed up. Yeah, that's well there. It's been interesting. I read a report probably a year ago where they were talking about some of the seeds from when you have crops that are um, built, you know, that are next to each other, you know, you have one farmer that's using genetically modified and one that's not, that they've had problems with the genetically modified um, seeds getting into the organic ones, you know, because of blow, you know, the wind blowing and stuff like that, or just, you know, things happen. And so you look at that going, gosh, you know, so you really have to look at the bigger picture here because it really e it's super easy to get a lot of the stuff kind of mixed up in some ways. Yeah. And I'm not saying um, that um, science is bad as far as, you know, the things that they're working toward to make improvements. Um, but I think that we definitely need to be more conscientious as a public and as scientists are making um, these amazing changes to determine whether or not those changes are truly something that's beneficial and really consider the future. And that's one thing that in the school, I don't know if you remember this, but in the school that G, that Mia went to, um, I was going to say Junia because that's her official full name in the book, but her nickname's Mia. Um, in the school, I do mention that there's a futures class because to me, I started to think about education and where that was going to go, and I started realizing, you know, we focus so much on history and looking at the past, but what if there becomes a shift where we decide, you know, the future is just as important, and we actually have a futures class that focuses on everything.
everything that exists in their specific time, 2028, and how the things that they are focused on or are working on scientifically will impact the future. So they're going through these um, mind maps and brainstorming and trying to figure out all the different possibilities and um, making sure that they're focusing on things that will progress to sustain because the population is dwindling. Um, they are becoming extinct, so they don't want to make a, a mistake by moving forward with something that's going to um, cause their numbers to diminish any further. So for them, the futures class is crucial to look at what all the different um, potential consequences are because they don't want to focus on anything that's going to have a consequence that's going to affect the population. And so that's just something that I think that's important even for us now. You know, what great science is doing this, but what does that look like in the future? What are all the potential consequences as a result of the actions that we're taking now? And what of those consequences, are, are the majority of the consequences going to be positive, or are like one third of the consequences going to be negative, or are one third unsure as far as if we don't know what the consequences are? So just things like that we need to think about when it comes to science. Well, it seems like a lot of these different things um, that we've been discussing, they, they really fall within that unsure category. You know, there's, there hasn't been, in, in, from what I've seen, I haven't seen enough that there's been enough research that says potentially things can um, affect people one way or another. Yeah, that's true. Uh, medicine, though, I noticed, like, um, when you look at the, it's, me and my husband actually make a joke of it when they have the commercials and when you look at the um, papers that you get from the um, the pharmacy where it has all the potential side effects and it's like there's an example right there, right? As a human person, we have to look at medicine and we have to determine, you know, what are all the consequences, you know, what are all the side effects that could potentially happen and is that something that I'm willing to put into my body to to improve it, you know, what's the risk factor associated with putting that medicine in versus um, continuing on with whatever it is that I, that I, that I have, like whether it's high cholesterol or whatever it wants. And then when you look also in, in how um, the medication you know, is being used to disperse, I think they even had something where it was like, Oh, it was in Seattle. They found traces of opiates in um, muscles. And I think that they were using, it was um, for people who are going through um, withdrawals. And so you look at this, you know, kind of um, how there's kind of cross-contamination within nature based on, you know, product that we're using today to help people, you know, I think it was Oxycontin is what they were using to, um, you know, get off of these different opiates that they're using or heroin. Yeah, but Oxy is just as addictive. <laughs> That's the bad part. Yeah. Um, and so to kind of toggle back to your writing process, when you look at, you know, when you're doing your writing, do you write it all out once, you know, as a first draft and then give it to the editor? Or are you doing this chapter by chapter? Oh no, I complete the manuscript and then I give it to um, the editors. But actually for Macy and the Magi, um, this one happened a little different in that my developmental editor um, said, you know, you need a lot more added to this specific book. So what I've done is I've given the line editor the portion um, that I gave to the development editor with some additional pieces, um, but I'm still not done with that, so I need to still give her the rest of the manuscript. So that one ended up a little different. Yeah. In that it didn't, it's going to her portions. Yeah. Well, and for our young writers out there, what advice would you like to give them? I would. I would say that you know, it's important to read. Definitely read in the genre that you want to write in so you get a sense for um, what other readers are going to be expecting. Look at the different storylines, character arcs, what is it that the characters um, exhibit because a young adult character will exhibit um, reactions 
to specific things just in the adult mode. And so it's really important to make sure that you're reading in a genre. But also learning the craft. So reading a lot about the craft and how to write and how to create plots and how to create character arcs and how to build worlds. You know, all the important pieces that you're going to need. Um, world building is more important when it comes to science fiction and fantasy, not so much with um, contemporary. But still, depending on what um, area you want to write in, you definitely want to learn the tools needed for that specific area. And then write. <laughs> Practice makes perfect, right? That's a popular saying. The more you write, um, the more you share it with people and get feedback, the more you're going to be able to grow as a writer. So reading, both in the genre that you want to write in, so the um, fiction and non-fiction, and then reading also on your craft, and then writing. I think that's really good advice. A lot of times people think, I'm just going to start writing, not really knowing maybe the category that they're looking at, you know, to yeah. really excel in. And you really have to know all, you know, all different ways what that's like. Definitely. And, um, it's, if you're young, it's great. Start now. <laughs> Follow your heart. <laughs> That's one of the things I write in my book because from here, it's about following your heart to to what's true to you. And so, um, you know, that's what I would definitely say to any young writer is follow your heart to what's true to you. What's something that you want to do, do it. Um, don't focus on, on money. <laughs> focus on what you're going to love. Well, and, I mean, when we look back, it's always easier to go, oh, I should have done this or done that. I mean, you had <laughs> an immense, you got this great background. I mean, organizational skills, I'm sure, really helps with being able to develop the roles that you're developing. Do you have any regrets looking back? Oh, my gosh, I should have done this a different way. No, and the reason for that is I've learned so much from my life and from all the different paths I've taken. Um, I think even having a doctorate um, has helped me because I've been able to finance my own publishing company, my independent publishing company, and so without that, I don't know if I would have been able to kind of push my book and get it out there and have the quality editors that I have um, that worked on the book. Yeah. Well, you can really develop it the way that you want and keep the story true to what it is that you're writing about. A lot of times, um, this happens with indie publishers or publishers when we're working with them, they'll ask us to adjust the story so that it fits a certain narrative because their perspective is different than our perspective. Definitely. <laughs> So that, that's been amazing, and I, I appreciate that you said that because, you know, it's kind of, even though you have this tremendous education and done all these great things, that you've really been able to return back to one of your true loves, which is writing. Yes, I'm so happy about that, too, because I have so all the stories, and I was like, okay, I need to be able to get it down now. Um, so I'm glad that I made the time. Yeah, that's one thing. I also teach Seven Habits for Hired um, Effective People, and I taught it recently to um, some employees at the hospital that I work at, and when I was teaching it to them, some of the concepts that we talk about is, you know, the power of words. And so, you know, it's just so important that um, when it comes to time and making the time that I, it's important for myself and for everybody else that when, when we say, oh, I don't have the time or there's just not enough time, it's, it's really us creating an obstacle for ourselves because we have control of our time. We shouldn't allow time to control us. So we need to use language that says, you know, I, I do have the time, I just need to schedule it <laughs> type of thing, um, or I will make time for it. Because, um, you yeah, we, know, we need to take control of the time that we have. Yeah, language is so important if we're constantly saying we don't have time when we're just going to get more of not having time, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, that, that makes it a little difficult to do anything. So, and, um, so Christina, I know that, gosh, you, I so appreciate you taking out the time to be with us here today. I know you have a very busy schedule. Don't you have an event coming up here soon? I do on June 9th. 
at um, Fig Garden Regional Library in Fresno. And so I'm very excited about that. I'm going to be announcing a contest. It's a fan art contest. I'm very excited about that. I'll also be sending the information out via my newsletter. So if individuals want to learn about this fan art contest, um, they can go ahead and go to my um, website and join my mailing list. It's at the very top left corner <coughs> or towards the right hand side of the page. I have two areas where they can join the mailing list because I'll also be sending out onto my newsletter and it indicates the fan art contest. So that will last around two months and I'm very excited to start seeing the artwork that people are going to be presenting um, that's tied to the book. Oh, how exciting. Well, you know, I've been to the Big Garden Library and it's fabulous. You know, it's one of, I think, the, the just the nicer libraries within the Fresno area. So what a treat to be able to be there and doing your reading and uh, I know you're going to do Q&A and book signing as well. So anyone yeah. who's within the Central Valley can definitely drive and attend to that. But that will be a fun event. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. connecting with my fans <laughs> or, or people that are with the fans. <laughs> people just looking to see what's going on there, you know? Because it, it is a very, I find it to be a very compelling story, and I think readers will pick it up going, gosh, you know, it, it just really, when we talked about this when we first started chatting here, you know, it, it really gives pause. You have to kind of sit and think, gosh, is this how I want my world to be for my kids and my grandkids, you know? Right. Well, I think um, another um, message in there is sustainability with um, what we're doing now. Yeah, and to really take a, a strong look at that. Well, and so, you know, why don't you give us your website one more time, Christina, so our listeners can connect with you and be part of your community. I signed up for your newsletter and your community, and I highly suggest everyone do the same. My website is www.christinaenquist.com. So that's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-A. E-N-Q-U-I-S-T dot com. You know, Christina, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you. So, I'm so glad that I had this opportunity to speak with you, and thank you. Well, thank you again, Christina. It's been such a joy to spend this time with you. Again, if you're looking for Christina's book, you can visit her website. It's available on Amazon and, of course, at select bookstores. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.